Before that, um, one John Creedon takes us from a clone to Zurich, where he compiles a soccer scrapbook on the Cork City Football Club. Mardike, home to Cork soccer in the early part of this century. Back in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, names like Wade Carter, Johnny Patton and even Stanley Matthews graced that sacred turf out there. Times were hard but the house full signs seemed to go up just about every second week as the Cork throngs made their way down the Mardike through each elm tree to see the stars of Cork Athletic, Cork United and even Evergreen who were from the other side of the city. Stand tickets were at a premium in those days, and so too was money. But admission was free of charge in the poor man's stand, as they called it, a hill on Shanachiel overlooking the ground. And there was always room for one more in the poor man's corporate box. Association football was introduced to Ireland through the British Army and quickly took root in the back alleys of Dublin, Belfast, Cork, and the garrison towns that still dominate the National League. Towns like Sligo, Dundalk, Athlone, and of course the naval base in Cove. Even today, Cove Ramblers are still jokingly referred to by some as Queenstown FC. But the earliest record of a soccer club in the county goes back to 1895, when Ahabeg was founded in the North Cork town of Buttevant by Michael Lenehan, a local national school teacher. The Monster Football Association was founded in Cork in 1901, and in an effort to promote the game here, Manchester City came in to play a Monster selection in 1909. Indeed, the complexion of the Munster League table that year suggests the local population was still just getting the hang of the game. The Royal Fusiliers were top of the league, followed by the Sherwood Foresters, Hall Boland Naval Base, the Welsh Fusiliers, and popping up the bottom of the table, the local lads, Cork Celtic, with no points at all. The early 1920s were extremely difficult years for organised sport in the city. Lord Mayor Tomás McCurtain was murdered by Crown forces in 1920. His successor, Terence McSweeney, died on hunger strike in Brixton Prison on October 25th. And before the year was out, Cork City Hall had been burned to the ground by the Black and Tans. By 1924, the Ford Motor Company, Cork's biggest employer at the time, created its own professional football team, Fordsons, and entered the Free State League. To bolster their playing staff, the Tractors, as they were called, recruited from Britain young men, particularly from their Ford works in London. These imports became known locally as Dead Dagenham Yanks. From their ranks came Belfast-born Harry Buckle, whom Fords had signed from Sunderland. Harry settled in Cork and started a family that was to become a Leaside sporting dynasty. Yeah, my great-grandfather was Harry Buckle. He played with uh, Sunderland and uh, he played uh, international football with Nor Northern Ireland. Um, you know, he came over here and then he won, um, he won uh, an FAI Cup medal as well with, um, with Fordsons. And uh, my grandfather was uh, Bobby Buckle, who won the Nephew Cup medal as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of soccer on my side of the family, and, uh, you know, I'm very proud of that fact. The tradition of supplementing local talent with cross channel players has continued right up to the present day. But no one has ever captured the imagination like Rach Carter, who signed for Cork Athletic in 1953. At the time, British football operated a maximum wage rule, ensuring that no player in the English league could earn more than £14 a week. No such rule existed here, and by signing for Cork, Rage Carter became the best paid footballer in Britain and Ireland. The deal was simple, £50 a game plus expenses, which earned Rage the nickname Rich Carter. But the crowds loved him, and he was the star of the show when Cork Athletic met Evergreen in the All-Cork Cup final of 1953. It finished two all in Dalymount, and despite protests from both Cork teams, the replay was again staged in Dublin. It ended 2-1 with Carter getting the win. Rach had set a trend that saw some of England's top stars wear the Cork colours. Eddie Crossan, Jeff Hurst, Rodney Marsh, Bobby Tambling, Terry McDermott, Trevor Brooking and of course, Georgie Best. When I saw you, you looked like a 
like a diamond as you played in the dust of the ground. Just a boy from the country of Ireland, and I knew I could make you shine. Cause you move like a downtown dancer, with your hair hung down like a mane. And your feet playing tricks like a juggler, as you weave to the sound of your name. Georgie, Georgie, they call you the Belfast boy. Georgie, Georgie, they call you the Belfast boy. Best joined Celtic in 1976, stayed a couple of weeks, drew huge crowds, took the cheque and went home. In January 1996, an order was made in the High Court for the winding up of Deck Bay Limited, the company that owned Cork City Football Club at the time. Within hours, the padlocks were slapped on the gates of the new stadium in Bishopstown as the for sale signs went up over the Field of Dreams. At the 12th hour, though, a group of local business people, letting their hearts rule their heads, decided to buy the club title and the players' contracts. Immediately, they appointed Dave Barry as manager, reverted to the old red and white colours of Cork, and moved the whole thing, lock, stock and barrel, into Turner's Cross, the spiritual home of Cork soccer. It had been a winter of discontent at Bishopstown. The Cork soccer public resented the relocation of the club to the western suburbs, away from the traditional heartland of the game. Atrocious weather led to numerous postponements and appalling football. The result, dwindling attendances and spiralling debts. A court action arose for the payment of over £46,000 to Cork builder Martin O'Callaghan for work carried out at the new stadium. The company also owed over £80,000 to the revenue commissioners and Justice Costello was forced to liquidate the company. The Bishoptown debacle was just the latest in a litany of lost opportunities. A few years earlier, Flower Lodge, home to the great Cork Hibs team of the 1970s, had been bought by the GAA and rechristened Porky Ring. And now, with the collapse of Bishopstown, it seemed as though Cork soccer was to become homeless once again. The club's popular manager, Damien Richardson, had resigned and moved on to Shelburne, and from there he signed Cork City star striker Pat Morley. It was now Dave Barry's job to try and pick up the pieces. Well, I think the first year when I, I took over was, uh, there were seven games to go in the league, and we were fourth from the bottom, and I think really it was a... Uh, just um, it was a damage limitation exercise then that uh, just to stay in the Premiership, not to take the, the, the club down. Having steadied the ship, Barry trawled the Munster Senior League and the English leagues for young Irishmen willing to throw their lot in with Barry's babes. His next target was a place in Europe, and by finishing third in the league that year, City qualified for the Intertoto Cup, a backdoor to the UEFA Cup. came Standard Liège, whose European pedigree included a Cup Winners' Cup defeat at the hands of Barcelona. This is European competition, you get nothing easy in this Cup League. You want to get your minds fucking right, this is going to be a right tough fucking physical battle. At this level, what they do is to, they tend to try to drag you around the place and knock the ball around, so you start chasing shadows. They send it over a team that they think can walk in here and beat us on the path. You really have to... Um, be very organised and, and um, hold your head in these games. And hopefully we'll have a fucking, a fucking game that we can look back at, no matter what the result is, and remember it for all the right reasons. I think the tendency for a lot of players is to go trying to chase the ball and try to get on it as much as you do in League of Ireland, but that doesn't happen really. And the only thing is, you have to compete in these games to realise that. You know, it's no use for me sitting down at a table telling fellas. 18, 19, 20 year olds that uh, they won't get on the ball as much because, as you know, at 18 you think you can beat the world, you know. Yeah. So I'm sure after this game they'll, they'll have learned a lot. And the one thing that hasn't left us though, and that I'm fucking with this panel, is the attitude you've shown in every fucking difficult place you went to. And this is one of the difficult battles tomorrow. Okay. Get your minds fucking right now. No, that's just right. <laughs> Despite their star billing, Standard get off to a jittery start. And while Cork's priority was to give nothing away at the back, more and more chances fell to the lads from the cross as the game developed. In 
Encouraged by the continuing waves of attack on the opposition goal, Barry decides to go on the offensive, replacing midfielder Mark Herrick with a striker from the bench, Damien O'Connor. In the closing minutes, Standard 2 came close, causing high anxiety in the Belgian dugout. But it finished all square. An opportunity missed, perhaps, but it's one down and three to go. The next leg will take City from the cross to the Holy Land. Despite the 5 a.m. rally, the troops seem in good form as they assemble for the long haul to Tel Aviv. But Patsy Frayne, just like Arsenal's Dennis Bergkamp, refuses to travel by air. However, Dave Barry and assistant manager Liam Murphy refuse to take no for an answer, and Patsy takes his medicine like a seasoned pro. For the new kids on the block, however, this was going to be a first venture into Europe. Not that you'd ever guess. After 14 hours travelling, including a two-hour wait on the tarmac in London, the lads eventually arrive at Ben Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv. Once inside the terminal building, we're greeted with the news that all the training equipment and kit is still back in London. There were long delays and strict security as we queued at immigration control. We did manage to locate one box, but it wasn't ours. So we pressed on to Haifa, two hours away to the north. At our hotel, another surprise. Eddie O'Halloran and a group of about 30 Irish peacekeeping troops serving just over the border in Lebanon got wind of the match and drove down to meet us. Over the coming days, they will become our constant companions, supporters and backing band, earning the title Eddie and the Peacemakers. Friday morning, 4th of July, the Dan Panorama Hotel, Haifa, Israel. Well, the story so far, there's still no word on the missing kit. Apparently, our brand new red and white strip is in Gatwick or someplace like that, and the airline are currently trying to track it down. Uh, Dave and Liam are also trying to track something down, a training pitch. We were guaranteed before we came out that the players would train in the stadium on the evening before the match and on the morning before the match that we would have access to another training pitch. However, this hasn't materialised. The best offer we've had so far is the local playground across the road. Uh, I think at this point Dave and Liam have settled on the idea of going to the beach despite the heat and uh, maybe getting the players to do a run there and to fill the lungs uh, before this evening's training at the stadium. But for now it's downstairs and off to the beach. I guess that is no Making the training facility there, Dad. And uh, it's brilliant. It's been in bad and hassy. <laughs> Big Slavia pride would have proved they were sent down to y'all to train. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hear anybody criminal about the training facilities anyway, Jack. Our hosts, Maccabi Petatikva, are based 100 miles away near Tel Aviv, but they opt to play this fixture in the stadium of their affiliate club, Maccabi Haifa. Well, it is the closed season in Israel, their home pitch is being resod, and few fans are expected to travel up from Tel Aviv. The missing kit finally arrives on the morning of the match, and with the temperature tipping the mid-30s, City opt to play in their all-white away strip. Patsy is still carrying a knock from the Belgian game, but team physio Tim Carey has all the knacks. Lads, put some blood on your yes. yeah. Some blood on your forehead. Yeah. Yeah. Outside the dressing room, club director Noel Feeney is standing by with the old reliables. Presentation plaque, some block, and holy water. 
and by kickoff time, the mood inside the dressing room has sharpened considerably. Come on, sit down. Keep it simple and disciplined, right? And don't fuck it out. Come on, boys. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. No. Ready? Come on, John. That's okay. Hang on. All that remains to be done now is Noel's traditional blessing of the players, and we're on our way. Come on, boys, come on, hey! Are we ready? Ready, okay, okay. Let's go! Come on, boys, come on, lads! Let's do it proper! Come on, come on, come on, boys, let's go! Let's look, Johnny. Chance. Come on, boys, on the start! Let's fucking go! Come on, City, hey! Yeah, boys, one of the ironies of this fixture is the ethnic makeup of the cast. The match officials are from Kuwait, so in effect, what we're about to witness is a battle between Jews and Christians, with the Arabs in the middle trying to keep the peace. Both sides play keep ball in the first half in an attempt to run the opposition into a lather. But by the second half, it was all caught. Seven minutes after the half-time break, John Caulfield was brought down in the box and should have been awarded the penalty. The Turkish referee said, play on. And if the match officials didn't see that trip inside the box, they also missed young James Dunn, who was dispatched like a good Samaritan to deliver water to the players. On the ref's blind side, of course. Midway through the second half, Brian Barry Murphy is taken down. And Kelvin Flanagan's strike wasn't too far off the mark. At this point, club chairman Terry Dunn begins to wonder if the goal will ever come. And in the closing minutes, his prayers are answered. Almost. Oli Cahill on the left wing loses his marker and whips it across. Hartigan is waiting at the other end and with his first touch rattles the goalpost. Petra Tigva nil, Cork City nil in the searing heat of Israel. 35 degrees Celsius, Cork City did our country proud with a tremendous performance. At the final whistle, the players all make a beeline for a Clare man who has become City's number one fan for the day. Private Gary Maloney lost his leg in a horrific landmine explosion just a few weeks earlier. Today is brilliant. Today is my first day out since I got to Haifa. Actually, it's my first day out since the day of the accident. And uh, to come to a match, get the jersey, be the only one out of the whole group, even though I'm not a Cork man, with the jersey on, and listen to boys on the pitch with the Cork accent in the middle of Israel, in the middle of this, shouting and roaring, is just the business. It's brilliant. And the whole crowd, we walked in, there was a big roar, like, you just can't ask for better last night. Players had observed a strict code of discipline in the days leading up to the game. There was no sunbathing and no alcohol. But they were off the leash now, and it was getting a little late in the evening for sunbathing. Indeed, it was beginning to look as if the post-match celebrations were attracting more attention than the game itself. As the good folk of downtown Haifa came out to witness the gusto with which only the Irish can celebrate an ill-all draw. Next morning, well, lunchtime actually, it was back on the bus and a rather muted trip to Jerusalem. Nothing could have prepared us for the impact this ancient city has on the visitor. Jerusalem, of course, is central not only to the Christian story, but sacred to Jew and Arab also. 
For some members of the squad, it was an opportunity to record a once-in-a-lifetime visit. And the waiting wall provides Mark Herrick with a moment or two for quiet reflection. Our guide, Haim, explains the phenomenon of thousands of little paper notes that fill every crack in the wall. It's like, you know, among many Christians, you have the wishing well. Mm. This is like the wishing well. Everybody writes a note, my family is sick, my mother is sick, my wife cannot conceive. By writing that note, maybe God will help. And the notes could be there for centuries. If the wind blows, then they clean otherwise. And they believe that God comes in, in the evening and reads all the papers and tries to provide some, some problems. I mean, that's the tradition. Jerusalem is steeped in a number of traditions, but Kelvin Flanagan is particularly moved by the Arab Quarter. First impression of Jerusalem is amazing, amazing, really. Never seen anything like it in my, own, my life. I can't believe it. I just after saying to Mark Herrick, I said, I can't believe how people actually survive in the Market Street. Sure enough, it was a heady mix of smells, spices, sweetmeats, and security. So, time to bid farewell to Israel. After all, we're expecting guests back in Cork. And the big so and the excellent football club also, and the beautiful women. Cologne arrived in Cork with a squad boasting seven full internationals, including the Austrian Tony Polster. But a wet Wednesday in Turner's Cross is no place for the faint-hearted. Phil Harrington, the Cork City goal. Just a couple of minutes into this uh, first half. And a lively opening to the game too. Ali Cal battling hard. Good play by the Cork City number seven. Oh, great skills by Cal once again. This is what he's good at. Now Hart again to Cal and Cork will surely no. Montino with the corner kick, left-footed and oh, it's gone in. Somehow it's found its way in. Dave Hill taking this free kick, loading it in. Hart again, and Caulfield this time puts it in the back of the net, but uh, there was a push down the line for the fullback shirt. He pulls it back for Polster, and Polster lets fly. Oh, it's in! Goal number two for Cologne, and Tony Polster has got it. And that's how it ended Cologne 2, Cork 0. But well, the hometown team gets a standing ovation for their spirited performance. Just disgusting, really. We got a fucking poxy goal. The second goal, great. What can you say about the second one? But I mean, the first goal was just a fucking pox. We battled hard, and in fairness, I, I think we deserved. We, we thought we. We, uh, I think we, I think we should have done. I think we, a lot of people aren't, would be happy with our performance. After that. We really tried really hard. And I'm, I'm just kind of disappointed that we didn't really. Well done, lads. Well done, Pity we're not playing them over in Germany. I think we catch him in the second leg. <laughs> <laughs>
Dave certainly knows a thing or two about European competition, having been on the receiving end of a few defeats along the way. But then there have been a few high points too, like the visit of the mighty Bayern Munich to Musgrave Park in 1992 to play the local part-timers. Yeah, it's difficult, I think, uh, against Bayern Munich. I had my own business at the time, and uh, you know, I was working that morning before before we played them, and they were up in juries probably sitting in the jacuzzi waiting to play us, you know. German international Stefan Effenberg dismissed the local opposition, saying Dave Barry looked old enough to be his father. One of the reporters asked me about, about the comment, and I said, well, Stefan Effenberg played like my mother out there, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be giving him the money that he's getting, you know. Describe the goal. Well, you know, I think, you know, in, in, in Europe especially, you get probably get one or two chances against top opposition, and, you know, hopefully you keep your fingers crossed that you're going you're gonna to take it. But uh, I remember Mick Conroy won a great ball. Pat, Pat Morley, you felt that Pat Morley, he played me through, and there was one, there was one set to half in front of me, and uh, I said, if I can go by him, maybe we have a chance. And I went by him, and, you know, suddenly it's, it's me and the keeper, and you just put your head down and hit it as hard as you can, and it was an unbelievable feeling, really, when it hit the back of the net. And, uh, you know, after about 10 minutes there, there was about, you know, six or seven lads on top of me, and uh, it was a great feeling. The game that's fallen for Dave Barry. But that was then, and this is now. Back on the Euro Trail, City's next port of call is Switzerland. More rhythm. The squad arrived without first choice keeper Phil Harrington, who's back in Cork because his employers can't release him. So 20 year old reserve keeper Noel Mooney is drafted in for his first full game. It was to be a baptism of fire. FC Arau are a full time outfit located 50 miles north of Zurich. The attendance that day included a considerable sprinkling of Irish diaspora, like this Bow supporter who made the trip from Geneva. A Swiss girl with an Irish father. Two Germans who've been tracking City's progress ever since they visited the port for the Bayern Munich match in 92. A young local lad who seemed to think that Mick McCarthy and the boys would be in town. And these City fans from Skibbereen who flew to Paris, hired a car and drove the rest of the way. In stark contrast to the heat of Israel, the conditions in Switzerland were horrendous. And as the players took to the field, the assembled throngs rushed for cover. The two sides were evenly matched, and the visitors did create one or two chances in the first half. Hill making this interception, feeding Hartigan, onto Cahill, and Hill was back on his feet and in the penalty area for the cross. Flanagan tidies up, and City try again. The Cork lads managed to keep the ball in the Swiss half for long periods in an attempt to protect Noel Moody in the Cork goal. But when the Lyric man's test of character came, he was equal to it. The Swiss broke swiftly through the middle. Kraus picked his way through a forest of white shirts and unleashed a pile driver at the Cork goal. Mooney saved brilliantly, not once, but twice in quick succession. But the Swiss weren't finished yet. For the next 10 minutes or so, it was backs to the wall as the Blitzkrieg continued. Hill back to cover again. In their frustration, the home side began to cook up a storm. But Gareth Cronin replied by making a Swiss roll. Not that everyone got the joke. With just seconds remaining, City launched one last attack. A clearly exhausted Oli Cahill rides out a couple of heavy challenges. Plays the old one-two. Down the left flank and crosses for big known Hartigan. And so it ended, nil all. City finished third in their group and take home a cheque for 16,000 pounds. But as Patsy Frayne waved goodbye to Europe, little could he or any of us have guessed what the season was yet to bring.
difference a day makes. Twenty-four little hours. What a difference a day makes. It's no time to make a change. Just relax, take it easy. Colin! What have you been up to? I thought something was brewing. You're a star. Extra quality, extra flavor. Lion's the quality tea. For us computer fans, PC World has got the lot. Ireland's biggest choice, all at Ireland's lowest prices, with Easter offers like this internet-ready PC, printer and scanner for just $699, Ireland's lowest ever package price. Any questions, just ask. That's what we're here for. And we've Easter offers all week long. Welcome to our world. In the world. Don't miss out. PC World. Tanned and fit from the European exploits, City hit the domestic season money and clock up four league wins in a row to go top of the table by September. By November, the big Dublin clubs are making their presence felt. Bowes came to Turner's Cross and drew first blood. But City replied when Ollie Cahill's header rebounded off the crossbar and fellow Clonmel man Stephen Napier finished off the job. Ollie, Stephen and Kelvin Flanagan are the three Tipperary men of the squad, but they all now live and work in Cork. I start work at half eight every, every morning, Tuesday, Thursday nights, we train with Cork City, so it's a matter of just coming straight from work, grab your bags, maybe a cup of tea, and straight out to train. And I don't work at the weekends, but we train Saturday mornings, 11 o'clock, so there's no real break, no lying. And then Sundays we have our match, and well, the whole week is built around the match on Sunday, you know, so it's pretty hectic at times, but um, after a while you get used to it. But you never get used to living on a bus. For the part-timers of Derry City, Finn Harps and Cork, the travel demands can be horrendous. It's hard. I mean, as you say, I think we've done 1,500 miles there in one week and played, squeezed three games into it. And, you know, the Dublin teams, they have a lot of Dublin derbies. They don't have to go outside Dublin that often. Where our nearest away game, well, it's Waterford this year, but last year it was Kilkenny in Dublin. And it's not easy at times, you know, and I think it may take its toll towards the end of the season, but, you know, we're used to it now and, we're, you know, we're well used to going up and down on the bus to, to Dublin and Galway and Sligo and you know it's our results this season have proved that we don't mind traveling and I think for the last few years we've done well away from home so it's just a matter of getting used to it and you know you have to get on with it. 
European action included, the city squad clock off over 20,000 miles in a season. But it's the one-off, long-haul trips that take the greatest toll. We recently played in Derry in a, in a, a League Cup quarter-final, uh, which necessitated us leaving Cork at 6 o'clock on, on a Monday evening and, and, and overnighting in Bundoran. We didn't get there till 12. Uh, you play a match in Derry at half seven on a Tuesday night, you head straight back down the road after the game. Uh, and we didn't actually arrive back into Silver Springs in Cork till five past seven. By December, it was back on the bus and off to Inchicore for a Friday night appointment with St. Patrick's, who along with Cork and Shells were moving beyond the reach of the chasing pack. St. Pat's boasted three of Brian Kerr's world champs from Malaysia, including Trevor Malloy. Malloy. Oh, what a chip! A magnificent goal by Trevor Malloy. But everything Pats did, Cork did too. City came from behind three times to finish three off. And, Wood hesitated, and, that's a goal. and so began a series of drawn games that would leave Cork's league aspirations seriously dented. But the cup brings new hope of silverware. In the first round, City are drawn away to Bohemians, the team that beat them in their last cup final appearance of 92. Revenge is sweet, they say, but City fans could hardly gloat in this bizarre own goal by Bohemians Donald Brohan, which sees Cork into the next round. So, who is it going to be next? Number three, Cork City versus number four versus Derry City. This tale of two cities goes to a replay in the Brandywell. City come out on top and into an attractive quarterfinal clash against cup expert Sligo Rovers at Turner's Cross, a fixture that always gets the turnstiles clicking. Last year we turned over 250,000, which is possibly what any small business would be turning over, and uh, we have employees like any business, so uh, we need to turn over 250,000. Also, we suffer worse than most clubs in League of Ireland from travel, accommodation, um, and other expenses which are entailed with the, the excessive travelling that we have to do. Do you expect the club to turn a profit? Um, not initially. Every, every, everything, that's, uh, everything that's made at the moment is put back into the club. Um, we started off with, a, I think, a squad of 22. When Dave took over, um, we asked Dave in his first season um, to pick the players that he wanted for the following season, and he only kept five. So um, I think he did a very good job on a, on a tight budget to bring in 16 players. You know? So um, from that point of view, um, we try and churn everything that is made back into the club. So Noel, what is the business plan at Cork City Football Club? Well, our, our chairman, uh, Terry Dunn comes from a, a good business background and his plan at the moment is that we secure either our own uh, pitch or secure a long lease in Turner's Cross um, so that we, we always have um, a home ground and also to secure um, training facilities for Dave and his players. City have never won the cup in their history and the quarter final with Sligo was to be another big payday for the club. From early on Sunday morning the background crew is in action Noel makes her rounds, while groundsman Jack O'Driscoll runs up the club flag, with a little artistic direction from Finbar O'Shea. On the main stage, though, it was backs to the wall for Sligo. The boys in the northwest garrison town came under siege from the very off, and by half time the visitors were down 2 0, thanks to this strike by Patsy Frame. Followed by this well-worked piece from former captain of the Cork Miners, Colin O'Brien, who threaded an exquisite ball through four Sligo defenders. Flanagan was waiting onside at the other end to strike the fatal blow. Sunday has always been a day of great devotion in Cork. Different people, of course, worship in different churches. But on Sundays at 2 o'clock, a congregation of fundamentalists gather here in the shed to pay homage. Here they come now. Shed is a uh, famous now right, right around the, the country and uh, you know I think really when I came in as manager I think uh, the crowd, crowds had dwindled and I think really 
in the early 90s when we were winning the league, getting into Europe, Bayern Munich. And, uh, you know, these, these teams coming over, we had a tremendous support. But, uh, you know, for about a year or two there, it kind of, you know, drifted away from us. And it was one of my, you know, um, you know ambitions to really to, to try to filter on us cross and, and get, the, get the public out to support us. And, uh, you know, I'm just thankful that the, the atmosphere I now is second to none in, in, in the cross at the moment. Up the line, that's the job. Pushing ref, come on, man, give the break. There's no, there's never been a higher interest in the club. I would, I would suggest than there is there at the moment. Um, you're seeing young people wearing the, the, the jersey and the shirt at matches and everything else, and there just is a great atmosphere there at the minute. It's a very, it's a family atmosphere. It's a great camaraderie there at the minute. So, it's, it's something to look forward to, and hopefully it will get better. Sunday, for many of the Turners Cross faithful, is as much about having the crack as it is about the result. Seems to be a case of the community that plays together, stays together. Home attendances now average about 6,000, and with the final phase of ground development already underway, the eventual capacity will reach 12,000. They're so funny, the, the things that they come up with, and, um, and it, it relates onto the pitch then, the players can, obvious, can hear. You want Teddy there, Dave? Yes, we go, More than 30 coach loads of the Turner's Cross regulars make it to Athlone for the Cup semi final with First Division strugglers Athlone Town. Before long, Jason Cabia underlines the gap between the two divisions when he tees up Noel Hartigan for the first. Before half time, it was Cabia again with the perfect nip and top. Just minutes after the restart, up popped you know who. Second time lucky. But there are few as dangerous as a wounded animal, and the battling Midlanders restore local pride with a late consolation goal from Stephen Mullen. City managed to weather the final minutes, and they're now just one match away from winning the FAI Cup for the first time in the club's history. The late 60s and early 70s will be remembered all over Europe as the era of student protest. And here at home, the football grounds of Ireland provided the perfect stage for urban angst. It was Teddy Boys, Boot Boys, Rock and Roll and Rebellion. And soccer was the ideal vehicle. It was as though the establishment never really approved of a game that was seen to be littered with hard shawls, long hair and English accents. The feeling was mutual, as referees, guardee, and any other manifestation of law and order was considered fair game. Yes, the game is not over. The ball playing may be over, but the game isn't, as far as some of these spectators are concerned. But the quality of football was never better. Cork boasted two clubs, Hibs playing out of Flower Lodge, and Cork Celtic at Turner's Cross. Local derbies were usually all ticket and hot-blooded affairs. Stars like Carl Davenport and Dundalk's one-arm striker Jimmy Hasty drew huge crowds to the lodge and to the cross. Celtic had built a fine squad under former player Paul O'Donovan and finally claimed the league title in 1974. In 73, Hibbs beat Shells 1-0 in a cup final replay at Flower Lodge. Within months of raising the cup for Cork, Hibbs player manager Dave Bacuzzi was sacked by the board. Resignations and protest marches followed, and within three years, the club had folded. By the end of the decade, poor results and dwindling attendances saw Celtic go the same way. But the season 71-72 will always be remembered in Cork as a white-knuckle ride from start to finish. On the final Sunday of the season, Waterford, down to 10 men and trailing Cork by two goals at Flower Lodge, staged a remarkable recovery and scored three goals in the final 12 minutes. Waterford's lead. The following week, the two teams were to meet again in the cup final at a packed Dalymount Park. The day belonged to just one man, 
a little lad from Cork's north side called Maya. Marsden building on his left. Maguire gets back. Then he gets the cross. And Maya Denny has scored for Hibernian. In a couple of hours' time, the victorious Cork Hibernians team will be arriving back at Glanmire Station. They'll all be heroes, of course, but none more so than yesterday's man of the match, the man who is the first ever to score a hat-trick in an FAI Cup final, Maya Dennehy. Earlier today, when the Cork Hibs team visited the RTE television studios, we took the opportunity of talking to Maya and asked him what, a day after, he feels like after three goals. I feel very well right now. I was surprised I got three goals. Looking yeah. back on it, though, which of them was the most valuable and most memorable for you? Um, the second one. But why? Um, when John Herrick hit it up the middle, I think that myself and Maguire went for it, like, and uh, I carried it on a bit and got kind of in front of him, like. I seen Peter Thomas coming out, and I hit it to the left of him, and I hit off the bear, and I was in between three of them. I just banged it home, and like, no, it was great. As so often happens, success in the Irish League leads to cross-channel offers. It was only a matter of weeks before Nottingham Forest came knocking. I went down training one Saturday in the morning, and uh, there was some somebody came in for me, right? And they asked me would they like to go across. So I was delighted, right? So I went down training. I said about 15 minutes. I was in about two hours after. It was a great opportunity, right? I went over and I got a good contract over there, right? I enjoyed it over there. I was in the Forest team nearly nearly every week, right? Brian Clough came then, couldn't get in the side, and he asked me to go to uh, Warsaw, and I said, I won't go. So he said to me, if I be you, I go. And I said, why? He said, I'll have a training morning, noon and night. So I said, I go to Warsaw. So. The cream of the current crop have all had spells across Channel 2. Oli Cahill played for second division outfit, Northampton Town. Well, I was there for two years, and it started off pretty well, but then there was a change of manager and things didn't go well, too well towards the end of it. And they offered me a contract for a year, as I said, but I turned it down and decided to come home to play for Cork City. And it's been a better move for me because I think I'm playing at a better standard. And it's also given me the chance to pit my wits against the, the top teams in Europe and European football. Holly Carl battling hard. Good play by the Cork City number seven. Oh, great skills by Carl once again. This is what he's good at. Now Hart again and Carl and Cork will surely no. Gerald Cohn is another example with Cork City. He came back and he's doing um, he did his leaving and uh, he went back to school, which is it's very difficult for a player who who leaves at 16, 17, thinks he's gonna be a millionaire in another two or three years, play with a big club. But you know, things don't work out. They work out for one or two players, the Roy Keynes of this world is, you know, that's fantasy stuff and uh, but it doesn't really there's a lot of players come back broken hearted and I've sat down with one or two and that you know they have to pick up the pieces again and uh, go back to school and, and thankfully Derek Hall and Gary Cronin these went back to school and they've um, they you know they, they got their leaving cert and uh, they have an education behind them and you know a lot of lads went went into college or uh, you know got a got a very good job out of it there's a weave of GAA strands crisscrossing the core club and the City prepare for their cup final date with Shells, Brian Barry Murphy and Derry Collum, City's two under-21 internationals, are reminded that exactly a quarter of a century ago, their fathers played in the Cork Gaelic football team that brought the Sam Maguire to Cork. Jimmy Barry Murphy, the scorer of that one. There's a lot of lads playing GA. Well, as you know, Dave Barry, manager, is a legend in GA circles in Cork and throughout Ireland. And I actually played on the minor football team for Tipperary a few years ago. And played against Cork in the Munster final in Central Stadium and when Colin O'Brien happened to be on the opposing team he was captain that day as well and uh, he walked up the steps to lift the cup that day and I remember him well, his blonde head running around the pitch but um, a lot of the lads think Noel Hartigan plays for the Bars as well now and like there is a, there is a strong J influence running through the club. Working busily, linking up nicely with Dave Barry, looking for another score. I would say the relationship is definitely getting better between the J and the soccer and I think that uh, People are going to have to cooperate and are working with each other for the, the people that are playing board games. But that wasn't always the case. In the mid-1980s, Dave Barry was enjoying life in both codes until he was issued with an ultimatum. I uh, ran into a lot of difficulty with, um, you know, the powers that be in the in GGA circles, especially in Cork, because, uh, I, you know, I, I was very fond of soccer and I wanted to play soccer. And I, I remember in, in 70, 80, 87 when there was a code of conduct brought in, they were saying that... Uh, you know, any, any inter-county player had to give full commitment to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the GA. And uh, it was something that I didn't believe in. I think people go out and play, 
you know, on the free Sundays to play golf and to play basketball or whatever. And uh, I, I, I felt I, I could go away and play soccer. But uh, they were saying, no, if you play soccer, you can't wear the red jersey. And it was something that I was very proud of wearing. And uh, But it was a situation that they were giving me an ultimatum to give up a sport I loved and I wouldn't do it. And I went out to soccer that year, or I went out to GA that year and I played with Cork, uh, uh, Cork City that year. We, we went down and won a, a, league, a league cup medal that year. But, uh, you know, having said that, I was up against the great Kerry teams for in the early 80s and we, we very seldom only 80, 83 we got through to uh, any kind of semi-final but 87 I remember the lads went on beat Kerry and went to an all Ireland final which was always one of my dreams to do and I remember standing up behind the goal down in Killarney when um, the lads beat Kerry and I was saying I'd love to be out there. And not only did an All-Ireland medal elude Dave Barry, so too did an FAI Cup medal in 1989 and again in 92. You know, soccer is, is a big love to me, and uh, really, you know, if I had to do this, the, the same thing again, I would. No regrets? There's no regrets there. I think, you know, you have to, you have to believe in a lot of things, and I believe, in, I believe in, you know, myself, and, you know, I think in certain situations, I don't think people should dictate what, what kind of game you can play, especially if you're given a full, full commitment, which was doing, and, uh, you know, that's, that's part and parcel of life. There were exciting times.